everyone, it's Luke Kennedy with you again for Learning at Home TV. Coming up in English, we'll examine the features of procedural texts and learn how to write one just by following simple, clear instructions. In maths, we'll learn all about rounding to calculate change, and then we're going to take a closer look at the different feeding relationships between plants and animals. So I hope that you're sitting comfortably. Following a recipe, finding directions to where you want to go, or figuring out how to use equipment can be confusing if you aren't given clear instructions that are in the right order. Today, Pascal will examine the features of procedural texts and show you how to write one just by following simple, clear instructions. Hello. Have you ever followed a recipe to make something delicious? Have you ever completed a science experiment? Well, to do so, you would have followed a procedural text. Today, I'm going to show you how to write a procedural text. A procedural text is different to an imaginative text which entertains the reader, or the kind of informative text that tells the reader facts and information. A procedural text is an informative text that tells the reader how to do something. It gives directions or instructions to help us do, use or make something. Procedures include formal written recipes or science experiments, manuals on how to operate machines, instructions on how to use something and even directions on how to get somewhere. Can you think of a procedure you have followed? Have you had to give someone directions to get somewhere? To make sure things go according to plan, that our recipe turns out well, or that people get to their destination, the information in the procedure has to be very clear. Let's have a look at the features of a procedural text. This procedure is telling us how to make a puppet. The procedure has a goal or aim that clearly states what is to be done. This is often in the heading or title. For example, in this procedure, the goal is how to make a warthog puppet. A procedure has a list of materials or things you need, often listed in the order that you will use them. To make a warthog puppet, I can see I will need very specific materials. What do I need to make my puppet? I need two colours of paint, dark and light brown, plastic lids, paint brushes, cardboard, scissors, a twig or paddle pop stick and sticky tape. A procedure also includes a method, which is a series of ordered steps or instructions that are often numbered. Formal language is used, so the written instructions are clear and can be followed easily by anyone who wants to read them. For example, squeeze the paint onto two plastic lids. If we used informal language, it might just sound like someone speaking. For example, hey Manny, squeeze the paint on the lids over there. Written and spoken procedures use command sentences to give instructions on what to do. Before continuing, let's quickly review the four different types of sentences. There are questions. Questions ask for permission or information. For example, can I go to the shop or where is the shop? There are statements which simply state what someone is going to do. For example, I will go to the shop. And then there are stronger sentences like exclamations, which can show feelings or emotions. For example, I hate going to the shop. Normally, an exclamation will end with an exclamation mark. But for a procedure, we need to use command sentences. Commands give clear instructions or directions that tells someone what to do. For example, go to the shop. Let's take another look at our procedure and the commands that have been used. Squeeze the paint onto two plastic lids. Put your hand in the light brown paint 
and place your hand carefully on the cardboard are all command sentences which tell us what to do. Have a look at the start of each of our steps in our instructions. What do you notice? What do all of our steps start with? They all start with an action or doing verb, like squeeze, put and place. These verbs help us know that an action needs to be done. Did you notice that the verbs used in a command are mostly at the beginning of a sentence? And did you notice that the verbs are all in present tense? Because a procedure is giving instructions on how to do an action right here and now. Here's the puppet I made. I didn't have brown paint, so I had to make two. What's that? Oh! Did you know that you can also find procedures in imaginative texts, such as stories? Some stories include maps with directions or a recipe relating to the story, but mostly the procedures we find in stories are spoken procedures where a character uses dialogue Dialogue is the conversation or speech between characters. And they say it to tell another character what to do. For example, in a procedure in an imaginative text, a wise character may give instructions to another character on how to do something. In this case, a formal procedure with a heading and a list of materials and the method would not be suitable because Characters in stories have their own personalities and they act in different ways. And they also use informal language to give their instructions. Remember, informal language sounds like someone speaking using everyday language. Let's look at an activity that you can do later on to help you write your own procedure. Can you think of a story where one character tells another character how to do something. For example, how to catch a fox or how to use magic drums. I'm now going to give you a procedure for creating a formal procedure using an informal procedure that you might find in a story. Remember, first we need a goal. Our goal is to create a procedure from an imaginative text. I put this in the title. Then we need a list of materials. These will include your story. And you also need some writing materials. The method. The method will tell us how to go about creating a procedure from a story. It includes finding the pages from the story, rereading the information, summarizing the information into steps, and putting them into the right order. We then need to write this information into commands, ensuring they have verbs at the beginning and that the verbs are present tense doing verbs. Finally, we check the language is clear and formal. Did you notice the commands that I have used and all of the doing verbs? I've used find, reread, summarize, order, write and check. Practice creating a procedure from an imaginative text by following the procedure from this lesson. You could also try writing a procedure for making your favourite food or a procedure giving the directions for finding an item in your house. Get someone in your family to follow them. They will give you the best type of feedback by letting you know if your procedure was clear and easy to follow. Well, that's it for today. See you next time. Hi everyone, welcome back. Let's talk about money. Did you know that Australia used to have one cent and two cent coins, but they were taken out of circulation in 1991? 
Because our smallest coin is now five cents, prices like $3.99 or $1.93 need to be rounded before we can give the correct money. Let's learn about rounding to calculate change. Hi there, I've got some toy money. Here are some of the money. How much is it? I have $10, two $2, six 20 cent coins, one 10 cent coin, and four 5 cent coins. This is $10, $4, $1.20, $0.10 and $0.20. Cents. I can build piles to make them easier to count. $10, $4 and $1 makes $15. And $0.20, cents, $0.10 cents, and $0.20 cents makes 50 cents. So I have $15 and 50 cents. To make sure that we have enough money to pay for items, we can round amounts to estimate an answer. It's easiest to round to a convenient number, such as the nearest whole dollar. Here is an example. We can buy this notebook for $7.90 and a pen for $1.98. I have $10 to spend, so can I buy both items? Hmm, $7.90 is nearly $8, and $1.98 is nearly $2. So both items together will be eight plus $2, which is $10. So I can buy both the notebook and the pen. Let's invite Liam to help us with the next example. Hi, Liam. Hi, Annie. We not only use rounding to help us see if we've got enough money, we also use rounding to calculate the correct change. Because we don't have one or two cent coins anymore, all cash amounts must be rounded to the nearest five or 10 cents. Sometimes we round up and other times we round down. We just have to go to the nearest five or 10 cent number. For example, I'd really like to buy this skipping rope for $6.32. I can't hand over $6.32 because two cent coins don't exist. So I can either pay $6.30 or $6.35. Hmm. 32 is closer to 30 than 35, so I need to pay $6.30. Here you go, Liam. I'd like to buy this skipping rope. Thank you, Annie. Here is your 70 cents change. Thank you very much. Thanks, Annie. Enjoy your skipping. I will. Let's practice calculating change. If I buy this doll with a $10 note, how much change will I get? Well, $10 minus $3 is $7. So I will get $7 change. I hope you got it correct. There are many ways to get the correct answer. So don't worry if you do it in a different way. What about this box of pens? How much change from $10 should I expect? If I add 25 cents to the price, I get to $5. Then add another $5 and it gets to $10. So I expect to get $5.25 change. Last one. How much change will I get from $10 if I buy this toy car? If I add $1, I get to $9.90. So then I need another 10 cents to get to $10. So I expect to get $1.10 change. How did you go? Calculating change is a great skill to have, and it needs to be practiced a lot. 
you could try to practice every time you are looking at things to buy in a shop. Supermarket dockets even show the rounding for you. So have a look next time to make sure you've been given the correct change. Thanks for joining me today and we'll see you again soon. Calculating change is an important skill to have and very handy when you go shopping, so make sure you get some practice. Now it's time to meet another student in our My Place segment that features kids from across Queensland. Hi, my name is James Minicon. I live in Cairns. I go to Warrior State High School and I'm in Grade 10. Uh, one of the things I do like, like, even though it's not an order, I'm, I'm getting a lot more work done, less distractions, and yeah, just find it a bit easier than at school. Outside of school, I play baseball and do a lot of other sports like long jump, I play softball, and just athletics all around. Yeah, I just like being active. Uh, my favourite subject at school is probably HP Extension because it like, has a lot of theory to it. Obviously, got the fun prac side. And yeah, we learn a lot about like sports psychology and stuff, the way the body moves, and I enjoy that. There are many examples in nature of different species that depend on each other. I can think of bees and flowers as an example. In Science Today, Jen is going to explore the important relationships between plants and animals. Did you know that some of our rainforests are from the age of the dinosaurs? In North Queensland, there is a tiny pocket of tropical rainforest that has survived for over 150 million years, from when the dinosaurs walked the earth. It runs from Cooktown to Townsville and is made up of dense, lush, warm forests with trees that reach over 60 metres high, as well as gorges, rivers and spectacular waterfalls. This World Heritage listed site is home to a diverse range of wildlife, including mammals like possums, tree kangaroos and bats, as well as birds, insects, reptiles, frogs and of course trees and ferns. It is also home to the cassowary, which is the world's heaviest flightless birds. You may have even seen a cassowary before. They have glossy black feathers with striking blue and red colours around their face. And they also have a cask or helmet on their head. But remember to stay far away from a cassowary. They are strong and fast and can cause some serious damage. The cassowary is an endangered species, as it is estimated that there are only about 1,500 left in the wild. This is really important for scientists to know because cassowaries play a key role in the survival of rainforests. In fact, more than 70 different types or species of trees rely on the cassowary for survival. This is because cassowaries eat rainforest fruits and excrete the seeds as they move around the forest. From these seeds, new trees can grow. Some seeds even require the digestive processes of the cassowary to sprout. The cassowary has an important relationship with trees in the rainforest. Today, we're going to explore the different roles that organisms can have in a relationship. Let's stay in the rainforest. These images show some organisms that live here. They have been organised by their feeding relationships, and we can see two different sets of relationships that we call chains. In the first chain, we can see that snakes eat flying foxes to survive. Also, flying foxes eat the fruit from rainforest trees. So we can see two different relationships in this one chain. Let's take a look at the second example. In this chain, we can see that quolls eat birds, and the birds eat caterpillars. Also, caterpillars feed on the leaves of trees. Now we can actually classify these organisms according to their role in the environment. They can be either a producer, consumer or decomposer. 
Let's find out more about each role and use this information to organise our living things. Producers use non-living things from the environment, such as water, air, sunlight and nutrients, to produce the food that they need to survive. What type of organisms do you think can produce their own food in the rainforest? Well, all plants are producers. In fact, the part of the plant that makes it look green helps it to produce food. So let's label any plants in the rainforest as producers. This includes our fruiting trees and any other rainforest trees. Now, unlike producers, consumers cannot make their own food. So they must eat or consume plants or other animals to survive. Animals are generally consumers. So let's check our feeding relationships to identify some of our consumers. This would mean that our snakes, flying foxes, birds, moths, bees, quolls and caterpillars would all be consumers. Let's label these organisms as consumers. Okay, we can now see that all of the images have been classified by their role. But there was one more role we have to explore, decomposers. Decomposers are living things that feed on and break down dead or decaying materials. Examples of decomposers include bacteria and fungi. These are very small in size and can be tricky to find. They could look like different types of mushrooms that could grow on trees or logs, or are hidden on the dark forest floor. We don't have any decomposers shown in our chains of relationships, but they do play an important role in the rainforest. So by organising these living things based on their roles, we can now see how these organisms interact and depend on each other for survival. OK, let's recap what we've learnt today. We now know that living things have specific roles in an environment, and they can be identified as a producer, consumer, and decomposer. Now it's your turn. This afternoon, you might like to sketch your backyard or a different type of environment like a farmland or a pond and identify the producers, consumers, and decomposers. Thanks for watching. See you next time. The time has come to give our brains a break from learning whilst getting our bodies moving. Exercise is an important part of looking after every part of your body. And believe it or not, our next guest is taking you surfing. But I'm heading out the door, so bye for now. G'day guys, Tuke Millie here from the Gold Coast Suns. Staying active is really important for your health and wellbeing. And today I'm gonna to show you a couple moves you can do at home around the surfing. So what we're gonna do, I'm gonna put the surfboard off to the side, make sure you're about two meters around. Um, with lots of space, and we're going to start off with a side squat. So what we're going to do is you're going to step left with your left foot, crouch down, you can even act like you're surfing if you want to. You can try both feet, right foot, right foot to the side, out to the side like you're getting a barrel. For the second move, we're going to go into a push-up. You all would have probably done one in your lifetime, but if not, I'll show you how. So both hands go under your shoulders, and you can be on your toes. If you can't do it on your toes, go on your knees. So what you're going to do is lower your chest to the ground, Nice and low, and then push back up. Pretty easy, I'll show you again. Chest to the ground, nice and low, and then back up. So for our third move, what we're gonna do is we're gonna do the full movement for getting up on a surfboard. We're gonna go back on the ground like we were before in the push-up position. We're gonna have your body right on the floor, and what we're gonna do is pop up into that side squat position. So nice and fluent. There you go. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that and enjoyed the watch. Thanks for watching.